right, good morning again. Everybody doing good? It's always good to be able to worship with you guys, and uh, I'm excited uh, to continue in this series that we started last week called Fact Check. I don't know how many of you were here, and, and if you were not here, uh, let me just catch you up to speed a little bit of what we were doing. The, the idea is this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, what I would say in, in Christian terms, uh, you know, I guess what a, a, a phrase would be fake news that Christianity uh, spews out sometimes, even from our own uh, body, uh, not, not just us here, but the body puts out stuff that's really not even from the Bible. And, and we've heard that term fake news before, and there's, there's a lot of things that uh, can be put into check. Um, but what we said was we're, we're going to take four or five weeks here, and we're just going to do some fact checking on some simple statements and phrases of what you might have heard out in the world or that culture might say to, I mean, my, my opinion is to make ourselves feel better. Um, but because that's what we do as a culture, right? Uh, but in reality, the Bible says something completely different. And the things and the statements that you hear, like last week we said, follow your heart, you know, is one of these things that it's in our gut to say, uh, and it's a lot better than just putting our faith to the test. We want to follow our heart because, man, how do I know what everybody else is saying, if it's right or wrong? But there's a reason that these type of phrases just take off. Because it makes us feel better about ourselves. And today is, is not really much different. And uh, there, there's this misinformation that's all over the place out there. Uh, so we're, we're going to get into a, a different statement today. I'm going to hold on to it. But as we continue on, I want you to look into 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because we're going to use that chapter as the basis for really where, where I think this new statement comes from. Um, but uh, I'm not completely certain, and you'll know the phrase whenever you hear it here in just a minute, but we're going to examine things f through the lenses of Scripture no matter what. Uh, if you've been around Cedar Ridge for any amount of time, you'll have a good understanding that we are going to be in the Bible. Uh, this is not an op-ed, okay? That's not my thing. I, I don't do that, uh, but I'm going to dig back into the Word of God. And I want you to go on this journey with me. So this is, this is where we're going to go today. So before we get into 1 Corinthians 10, I want you to do this uh, imagination exercise with me, okay? You guys awake enough to do this? Uh, and if you need to go back to your happy place and close your eyes, you're allowed to do that. But I'll, I'll snap you out of here in a minute. But, but I want you to do an imagination exercise with me because I want to try to set this up. And, and this may or may not work. But uh, imagine that you are out on a walk. And you're out uh, a bit in wilderness, uh, maybe walking through the woods, and you're in a tr on a trail, okay? Uh, so you're out by yourself, you're walking on a trail, and you see this turtle. Uh, and this turtle uh, is, and I don't know if this can even happen or not, but this is why it's an imagination exercise. But this turtle starts climbing up this tree. Anybody ever seen that? I I've never seen it. But I want you to imagine with me that a turtle... He finds himself grasping onto the bark and climbing up this tree, and he gets to this limb, this branch, and he gets out on top of that branch, and then you just see this turtle launch itself off of the branch, flapping its little legs, its little stubby legs. I don't know what he's doing with that weird neck that they have, uh, but he's just flapping himself, trying to fly off, and what happens? He just smacks the ground. Uh, lands hard, luckily lands on his belly side down. Uh, and, and you're thinking, well, that's interesting. Never seen that before. Uh, and, and you're just kind of sitting back watching the moment happen. And what's crazy, the turtle tries again. Goes back to the tree, uh, goes back to the tree, starts climbing up, has this path marked out for him now. It's kind of like rock climbing, right? He's chalk it up, doing whatever. Uh, well, he gets up there, goes back to that, sec that branch again, goes out onto the ledge, goes onto this limb, and jumps and tries this again, and just starts flapping those legs and just smacks the ground again. And you're thinking, okay, I cannot believe what I'm seeing here. Uh, what is happening? Why is this happening? Uh, and you start to see this turtle crawl back for one more time. And you're thinking, okay, th surely he's not going to do this again. But he does. He starts climbing up. All the while, let your imagination run with me, okay? Uh, all the while, while he's climbing up, you, you see these birds up in the tree, and they're just watching this mama, daddy, bird, whatever, and they are uh, talking to each other, because that's what animals do, right? Um, they're talking to each other, 
And this turtle gets up to the ledge, and the birds say to each other, hey, do you think we should tell him that he's adopted? Um, and <laughs> All right. Okay, we were going to get there eventually. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, it, this is not my thing. But this is the reason that I say this. The reason I tell that really lame story and imagination exercise is because you can tell yourself a lot of things and what you believe makes a big difference in how you perform your life. The way you believe or the things that you believe are going to dictate your actions and what you do. Now, you don't have to be a turtle uh, to know, uh, well, you don't have to be a bird uh, to know that turtles can't fly. We know that a turtle can't fly. We know that it can't flap hard enough to, to levitate even off the ground for a second. But you are told something enough, you start to believe it. And, and that's exactly what can happen in our world today, right? We, we start to hear things over and over and over. But the reality is this, and this is why this is kind of the basis for this series. We need to hang on to the truth. What, whatever we might think it sounds good to us or whatever we think may make us feel better, we need to hang on to the truth. And if we haven't said this enough, I, I, we need to say it now. Our beliefs here, this church, we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. It is God's word, inspired and written through many generations of, of men who were connected to God, had this relationship with God. And, and throughout history, God inspired these authors to write down his words for us and, and for the rest of eternity, for us to see and to know God's will. That is the truth. And whenever you see the Bible and you see something uh, in the Bible, we know that it is God-breathed and it is inerrant. What does that mean? It is not false. There's no mistakes. There, there's no... And, and, and it can be fact-checked against each other. So we think that any of these things that are going, out, going on in our culture, there is something biblical that will back up and have an argument. Now, I'm not in the mood to have a bunch of arguments with people. I am in the mood to have a relationship with people. And if they want to have an honest conversation, then, then let's talk. And, and if our basis is that the Bible is God's word and God's word is the truth, then I can have that conversation with you. That's great. But I don't want to argue. I, don't, I know a lot of people don't want to argue. If you're an arguer, I, I need to learn a little bit more about this. I, I, I'm going to preach what I see and, and learn from the Word of God. And, and I hope that you want to do that as well. I hope that you want to tell those truths. That you begin praying for the people around us in our culture. That you listen to what people are saying. And, and that you engage in their lives. And you do that with the Word as your foundation, as truth. So what we're trying to do here is hang on to truth, okay? Uh, we're not trying to fly like a turtle because we've been believing something. We want to hang on to truth. So uh, th the great news is this. Even in 2022, when all these new rules exist, there are no mistakes in God's word. We, we need to understand that and, and go out on that truth. So probably the, the, the closest thing um, that we have to some of these statements are, are we're going to find some scriptures that have been distorted uh, by our culture, and this is the statement that we're going to go with today. Uh, things like this statement, God will never let you, God will never give you more than you can handle. Anybody ever heard that before? Uh, and, and that sounds great. Sounds great. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about this and how there's some balance that needs to be here. Um, but God will never give you more than you can handle. I, I'm pretty sure that I might have said that or believed that at some time. And, and, and Hopefully my heart is in check whenever I go back through it and, and we'll go through this. But probably the, po the closest part of Scripture to this idea can be found in 1 Corinthians 10. And maybe you know exactly the verse that I'm talking about. And I want you to read with me this verse 13 where Paul says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. That's where this kind of idea is coming from. But with the temptation... He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Okay, now that sounds pretty close to that, right? But it's not exactly that. There's really nowhere in that verse that says God will never give you more than you can handle. Um, now, the, Bible, or the world is going to tell you that, and the world wants to encourage you that. Your parents or grandparents may encourage you that. The, your teachers that might be faith, um, 
faith-backed teachers may have told you something like this. And I'm just going to say we got to be careful, and there's always some tension in things like this. we got to be careful because the Bible says something different. Now, this, this verse here, obviously probably the basis from where this comes from, but never does it talk about God giving you something, God not giving us more than we can handle. There's a word in this that we're going to kind of do some resourcing and some some checking throughout the word of God. Uh, there's a word here that sticks out more than anything, and that was that word temptation. Uh, there's a word temptation that also means trials. It can also it's the Greek word that means testing, trials, temptations. It's all the same word, and sometimes it's used in different contexts and sometimes in different reasons. Uh, and, and why we're going to see it. Here's really what that word means. It means this. This word temptation, it, it also means to approve or to assess, to, to a, appraise, uh, to, to find some value or find some genuineness, uh, to discern, to verify something. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, this last weekend, well, actually yesterday and the previous two days, was the NFL draft. I, I don't know. You guys understand that there was an NFL draft yesterday? Uh, I, there was a time in my life when my kids weren't running me everywhere, uh, and I'd sit down and I'd watch it, and I'd care. I, I'm looking to see who the Bears are drafting. I don't know why. They're never going to win. It, it's fine. But I, I, I'm interested a little bit. Now I can't keep up with it, and I, and I want to learn a little bit. But there's a reason that these drafts go the way they do, and that is because a few months or a few weeks, probably a month plus prior to that, there's something called the NFL Combine. Now, you know what that is? where these guys wear these like exaggerated underwear and they run real fast uh, and they time them and they do all these drills. What's going on in this NFL combine is that they're doing all these tests and trials. It's not something that you're going to call temptation, but they're measuring where these guys stand and how they would compete on the field and, and how they might match up uh, or how they might fit a role on these specific teams. So what happens yesterday and Friday and Thursday in this NFL draft is all because of this testing and these trials of trying to appraise these young men and where they may fit on the field. Does that make sense? That's what this same word that we're reading in 1 Corinthians 10, it's the same exact word. When you have temptations, when you have trials, when you are tested in many ways, you are being appraised and you're trying to see where you, find you, where you can be found value there. And if you look at this idea, you understand that this testing that Paul's talking about here, in some ways, can come from God. That there is a testing there, and it's always done to, dis to develop, to grow, to display your faith and my faith. When testing or trials or temptations in this word come into our lives, it's done to develop and display our faith so that God may be seen in a, in a better light. That's what's really going on there. So that, just like in the NFL uh, combine or in the NFL draft, so that these teams can be appraised in a, or can be seen in a different light. It's the same mentality here with God. He wants people to be dependent on him. And when we have trials and when we have tests or when there are temptations that come our way, he is finding out who is really dependent on him and who is really valuing God in their life. We're, we're going to see this word show up in different ways. First Peter uh, 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 6 says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. There's that word. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, uh, that more precious than gold, that that perishes, though it is tested by fire. Do you hear all this? It's being tested. So that it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you see why we're tested? So that we can bring glory to God and to his son, the savior of the universe. That's why you're tested. That's why you're tried. That's why you're giving things that, no, you can't handle. We'll get back to that here in just a little bit. But this testing comes from God, and it's to showcase God. It's to showcase what's going well in your life. It's to showcase how God is instrumental in your life. And there's this word trial here uh, that is also used, uh, not just a testing, uh, not just a temptation, but it's a trial. And, and really, it's about this perspective 
of this event. It's about the perspective of the circumstance. Is it a trial that's going on right here? Now, it, or is it, I mean, who's allowing this to happen? What we know is that God is allowing this to happen. But what is going on? What is happening? And this is where the Apostle Peter here is simply saying, hey, trials are going to happen. Anybody going through that right now? I mean, trials are going to happen. And if you deny that they're happening, you're really denying that God is trying to build your faith. Trials are going to happen in our life. And it shows up in James chapter 1. Maybe you know this off the top of your head. Where, where James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. It's going to happen. When you meet trials, it, it's kind of like whenever you fall into trials. You've heard that phrase before. It's like, oh, I just kind of fell into it. No, you're going to meet them head on. We are going to. And as you become more and more uh, of an adult, you're going to see more and more trials. You're, you're going to see them as young people. Uh, but later in verse 12, James also says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. So this idea is just trying to get us to understand these trials are going to happen in our lives. They're going to happen. Uh, there, there's one more meaning to that same word. We, we've already read it. We talked about testing. We talked about trial. But that other one is temptation. Now, when you see it as temptation, we need to understand this, and we need to make sure we understand this. It comes from a different source. God is not tempting you with sin. God put, may allow trials to come in your life, may allow tests to refine you, and so you can be assessed and, and see where you are. But temptations are coming from a different source. For example, like when Job is walking the earth, and Job is known as this righteous man, and there's this battle going on behind the scenes between God and Satan. And God says, yeah, you can, you can do whatever you want to my servant Job. But what, is, what happens here? That temptations come in, not from God, they come in from Satan. So there's a different source when it's a temptation. The temptations are going to come from sin or the people around us. But it's never, temptations from sin Within, from sin are never going to be caused by God. I, we need to be very clear on that. Is he going to allow trials? Yes. Is he going to allow these testing? Yes. Is, is there an understanding that sin is in the world and God knows that sin's in the world? Yes. But the sin does not come and the temptation of sin does not come from God. Satan has a different motive on this. We've talked about spiritual warfare before. We can go back and you can probably even check out some of our old series and see that. That's not about building our faith. That's about tearing us down, right? Uh, and, and Satan wanting us to fall into sin. So let, let's get all these things straight. We got trials and, and tests and temptations. And if all this stuff really is the basis for this whole idea of God not giving us more than we can handle, we, we need to have this, this base here. Um, but when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and this is really the word study that I wanted to lead back to this context. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is not in a bubble. You've got to look at it in a little bit of a context. And if you're ever reading throughout Scripture and you find these verses like this and you find that it's being distorted into a statement like that, it's probably being ripped out of context. So let's do some context seeking, okay? That's how we're going to spend really the rest of our time here together today. Uh, there's some context that we need to see where Paul is trying to take his readers on this journey. And in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 10, we see that Paul is in the middle of showcasing the history of Israel, really, is what's going on. Like, oh, great, some history stuff. Uh, you guys know I like to nerd out on this stuff, so let's, let's look a little bit, all right? Go back to verse 1. In verse 1, now, I'm, I'm not going to have all these scriptures up on the, on the screen for you, so I want you to dig into, your, into the Word if you can. I am going to read them, and I want you to know what's going on. But in verse 1, Paul says, I, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Any audience, any Jewish audience is going to hear this, going to be like, oh, he's talking about the Old Testament. Under the cloud, you know, the pillar of cloud, through the sea, you, you know what that is. It's like parting the seas or parting the Jordan River or whatever it is. There, there's a very Old Testament uh, context of what's going on here. And Paul says, you need to see that this has happened in the past. This cloud led them around. They passed through the sea. But he goes on to say, and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. So he's just kind of setting up the scene here. And these people had a God-given leader in Moses, and they were provided for. And this is what Paul says. They all ate the same spiritual food. 
They all drink the same spiritual drink. Now, there's this setting. We're setting up who, what's going on here. Here's an example of some trials in the Old Testament. Look at verse 6. Paul says, now these things took place as an example for us. This is the example. Uh, how to handle these challenges, right? Why, right? So we don't follow into these same things that all mankind's going through. But it goes on to say this. These examples happen that we might not desire evil as they did. And it says in verse 7, do not be idolaters as some of them were. And this negative example comes out. Don't fall into sin. Don't be idolaters. So you just keep reading. Verse 11, it says this. These things happen. All these things happen in the Old Testament to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. So he's talking to the reader now. They happen for them as an example, but they're written down for our instruction. Now, if they're written down for our instruction, what does that mean? We need to learn something from that. We need to glean something from this, right? Uh, so what are we supposed to learn? Verse 12 says it. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Okay, this is where the rubber meets the road, right here. I'm going to have trials. I'm going to have negative circumstances. I'm going to have temptations. There's going to be tests that come in on my life. Uh, so what do I do? I can look to the past and these examples and see what the Israelites did. I can look to see what all these people, all these heroes of the faith did. I can look to regular people in my family in the past, see what's going on there. But what am I going to do? I need to make sure that anyone, I'm the anyone who thinks that he stands, take heed lest he fall. What does that mean? If I think I've got it figured out and know how to deal with these circumstances on my own, there's a good chance I'm going to fall. This is what I, I love about how Paul just keeps unfolding this stuff. This is a universal experience, right? We live in this fallen world full of sin. There's going to be trials. You know you're, you might be sitting through a trial right now, and it doesn't matter where you stand with God. You could be a lifer, someone who grew up in the church, and, and you know uh, everything there is to know about the Bible. You can still go through a trial today. You could have just been introduced to Jesus last week. And I'm here to tell you, you're going to experience trials now. You're going to experience trials 20 years from now. And it's not going to change because that's the world we live in. Trials are coming our way, right? I think the biggest takeaway is this. If you're going to trust God, it's going to take something bigger than our willpower. And that's what verse 12 is saying. You don't just stand tall because you're going to fall if that's what you're going to lean on. It's more than willpower. And that phrase, God will never let you have more than you can handle, that's all about willpower. And, and we can't fall into this willpower idea. Like, it's going to be what saves us. Willpower is not a muscle that you can flex. It's not something you can just turn on, right? Willpower is more, more like a, a tank, kind of like a gas tank. You use willpower, you use willpower, you use it, and you use it, and you use it. But use it. But you know what eventually happens whenever you keep using it out of the tank? It's going to empty. And you're going to run on empty. And willpower will not be able to carry you through. And, and, and if you run on empty enough, you no longer have any willpower to use, right? So Paul's trying to tell us that we are going to fall if you're only relying on your own willpower. And he says, remember, God can provide, this, then he goes into verse 13, God can provide a way to escape these tests, these trials, these temptations. You can't do it on your own. So you see how we get to where that phrase comes in and why it's important to look back at the context here? You're not going to do it on your own. Nobody's ever been able to do it on their own. And, and, and this is what we have to understand. So I don't know if you've ever known anybody, and maybe you would include yourself on this, Anybody who would profess to know Jesus, uh, someone who would say, you, you would say, man, I, I know that they have a relationship with Jesus, and, and they've been strong at some point, but they've, they've gone and gone and gone working on willpower so much that their tank is emptied, and they've kind of fallen back a little bit. I'm not saying just completely fallen into sin, but completely gave up on trusting Jesus. Uh, may, maybe you know someone. Maybe you've been in that situation before. I, I would say sometimes we see someone, and you may find yourself as a 
in fellowship with this other Christian and say, hey, don't worry. God's not going to give you anything more than you can handle. You might, you might have said something like this. And if you didn't say something like this, you might have been tempted to think something like this. Because we're, we're going to be asking questions in our mind like, oh, maybe they just didn't trust God enough. And, and they're, they're taking God out of the math equation. And, and instead, they're trying to do things on their own. And they can, they can go on for a little bit. But you're in your mind thinking, oh, man, if they just kept this, don't worry. And you want to tell them, God's not going to give you anything more than you can handle. That's, that's kind of where that phrase comes from. And you're wondering why they're pulling God out of the equation. Well, I don't know about you, but I, I do realize that the Old Testament has a lot of examples of people who are in these situations of saying, I don't think I can handle it anymore. I'm ready just to give up. So I want to I go through a couple of examples throughout Scripture as, as we kind of wind down our time. And I, I want you to see people like Moses. Moses is the guy who has experienced this very thing. I don't know if you knew the situation, but in, in Numbers, I know you guys are reading Numbers a lot, right? Uh, in Numbers chapter 11, you see this thing that M Moses is dealing with, verses 11 through 15. Read this with me. Uh, where Moses is speaking to God, and he says, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you may lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all, the, all this people? Did I give birth to them? That you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers. And then he starts asking this question. Where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they weep before me and they say, give us meat that we may eat. Verse 14 is the big one. Okay, because this is where it comes in uh, with this. Basically, he's toiling over these trials. He says, I am not able to carry all this people alone. This burden is too heavy for me. God, if you treat me like this, kill me at once. If I find favor in your sight, then I may not see my wretchedness. Guys, this is Moses. Moses at his wit's end. This is a guy who led the Israelites out of slavery. This is a guy who went to the mountaintop of Sinai and, and received the, the, the commandments of the Lord, not once, but twice. You know, and this is a guy who went face to face with God for the sake of his people. This is a strong man of the faith who went out on a limb and believed that his staff could turn into a snake, and it did. This is a man who led people through a what we knew to be a dry ground that was once covered by a sea. This is a man who had seen it all. And now he says, kill me at once. I can't handle this. Do you see what's going on here? How does he get to a point like this? Uh, to, to say, this is too much burden for me. First Kings 19 shows us another example. Uh, it shows us an example of another big player in the Old Testament, this guy named Elijah. Maybe you know of this prophet. Elijah goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with these prophets of Baal, right? Uh, and, and God shows up in this big way to not only, not only humiliate these false gods and these false prophets, uh, but what really what's going on is that you see uh, Elijah oversee the slaughtering of all this as well. So there's some, this would have been a cool movie. I always attest to it. Hey, this would have been a great movie. Uh, but Elijah's a part of something huge. God shows up and takes out this little puny religion that they've got, right? But soon after this takes place, there's this queen named Jezebel. She finds out what has happened to her false prophets, and she writes this nice little note to Elijah. Let's read this note, okay? She says, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So she's frustrated. She's ticked off. Uh, then Elijah was afraid, and he arose, and he ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Verse 4, but Elijah, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die. Now listen to this. This is what he said. Is it enough now, O Lord? Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. This guy just saw one of the greatest acts of God in history. And now he's got way too much on his plate. So much that he can't handle. Do you hear it in his voice? Elijah, how does this prophet of God get to a point like this? These, 
these are, these are men who would have had it all in, in the face of the people that would have been following God. How, how does this happen? And you may be saying, well, these are just Old Testament things. These, these are Old Testament things. They didn't have the Holy Spirit like we have the Holy Spirit. You look in the church, they didn't have uh, the workings of the church and the encouragement that we may have and this new system and, you know, this advocate that Jesus la- leaves inside of us. They didn't have that. So maybe that's why they fall apart. And I'd say, well, hold on just a minute because I think we see some examples in the New Testament as well. I want you to look at 2 Corinthians now. 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, who just wrote uh, this other letter, uh, 2 Corinthians, Apostle Paul says in chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, he says, talking about his history in the church, in the church building, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction that we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death much of the same language how does a guy like the apostle paul a guy that met jesus face to face on the road to damascus a guy that heard from jesus himself how does he get to a point where he says i've been given a death sentence i can't go on we are so burdened we can't handle this do you hear this language from these great leaders of the faith this is you, you know what the good news is that puts us in the same camp as people like Moses and Elijah and Paul. We are not much different when we say, I can't go on. I can't handle it. It's too much for me to carry. I mean, that's the good news, is that we're no different than other great leaders of the faith. And and, and there's some people in here that I know are saying, I'm overwhelmed. I'm burdened. I can't handle it. I, I know that's the case. But I would need you to understand that these guys knew that they were at their wits end, that they were trying to work on willpower, that they were doing whatever leadership abilities that they had on their own, but they knew something else had to come from God. We don't have to land there. We don't have to stay there and wallow in that burden or that misery. We've got something else. The good news is there's something greater than human willpower. The problem is we've trained ourselves as a culture, even as a church culture, to just pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and say, we're just going to go do it. We're going to work this out. We've been given this great gift of God. We're just going to work it out on our own. But even the greats can be knocked down. If Moses and Elijah and Paul can be knocked down, you and I can be knocked down as well. And you've been knocked down, right? We we have been. Even the greats, I think there's a remedy for this. and And I think to redirect this, false statement of God will never give you more than you can handle. I, I think what we need to do is to realize, hey, we can, we can handle quite a bit on our own with this willpower tank, but the tank's eventually going to become empty. We need some wisdom from something more. And Jesus gives us some of that wisdom. He says these words to his followers in John 15. He says, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That phrase right there is what I want you to hang on to. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is a direct opposition to that phrase, God will never give you more than you can handle. Yeah, because you can't handle it on your own. You, you will never be able to handle it on your own. And, and Jesus says, you're not meant to handle it on your own. Because if you're apart from me, you can't do it on your own. You can do nothing. Put it pretty simply, right? Let's listen to Jesus instead of what culture tells us. Paul goes on to say, after that shared experience of of feeling that burden, right, in in 2 Corinthians, this is what he says after this, after this death sentence talk, right? He says, but that was to make us not rely on ourselves, but to rely on God, who raises the dead. He realizes the power God has. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. It's on him that we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Paul may have despaired of life itself, but he knew. He knew he had to rely on something more than himself or his cohorts. He knew he had to rely on God. And he wrote it down. There's no mistake that this is the way it was supposed to be. Last week, we pointed to, hey, how do you, how do you follow your heart in reality? Well, you inform your heart. You inform your heart with the word of God and your relationship with God. That's how you do it. 
That, that's what a real following of your heart is. That, that's going to be through that relationship with Jesus. That fact remains. And today, here's a truth that I want you to know. And this is really the only main point I have for you today is this, is that God is going to allow you to experience more than we can handle on our own. But he wants us to rely on him so, we can, so he can carry our burdens. It's always got to be about him carrying our burdens and not us trying to do it on our own. If we can come to that reality and, and realize that it is with his grace that it is possible to keep going. Paul said it himself, right? His grace is sufficient for me. His power is made perfect in my weakness. God's design is to get us to look to him. And the moment we start looking at ourselves is the moment we fail. Church, let's look to God. Let's always put our hope in him and never in ourselves. All right? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the truths of Scripture. Thank you for the experiences of your great leaders of the past. Thank you for showing us uh, the, the mistakes uh, of people even in our current time. God, we need all of these things to show us and to guide us and uh, about the way history shouldn't repeat itself, even within our own families and how... We can think that we're so strong, but God, we need to fully rely on you and you alone. You have gifted us in so many ways uh, to be your, your man, your woman, whoever we are. You've gifted us in so many ways to be strong human beings, made in your image. But ultimately, you still want us to rely on you and your grace. We thank you for that grace, especially the grace of Jesus on the cross who paves a way that we can never earn on our own. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.